Good morning, Heartland Church and our online church family. We're so glad you guys are joining us today. And hey, we really want to connect with you and know where you guys are watching from. So we're going to ask you to go ahead and drop down in the chat or in the comments where you're watching from. Drop your name and let us know because we want to connect with you guys. And if we haven't had the chance to meet, I'm Chris. And I'm Erica. We're the Youngs. We serve on the Communications Dream Team here at Heartland. And we're so glad to be serving with you guys today. And you know what? I'm not sure about you, but I'm a little bit sick about yesterday's Colorado performance. Not a big football fan, but I promise you primetime has my attention. And I'm sad, but I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord because I'm sure that today's going to still be a great day. Hey, and the Hoosiers came back and won, so go Hoosiers. <laughs> and look, we... We love what Heartland is doing here, and we're so excited about what God is doing and what we're able to join in and do in our city, our state, and our country by way of outreach. It's such a privilege that we get to go and do things, and you too can get involved with outreach and everything we're doing here at Heartland. Just go to heartlandchurch.com slash outreach, and you can see the ton of opportunities that you can get engaged and involved with to help our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, or if, you're, if we're helping people who have been impacted by hurricanes, or all the different areas that are going on, there's a lot of ways and opportunities to get involved, and we thank you for giving and being part of that so we can make an impact. Absolutely. I'm so thrilled to be a part of what Pastor Darren has set forth to make sure that we are a church that you don't just give to, you give through to all of these Absolutely. organizations and find ways to get involved to be able to help in your local communities as well. It is an honor and privilege. And look, we are in a very special season of life. We recently uh, empty nesters and we're, we're still <laughs> learning what that means and what that looks like. But what God is showing me in this season of our lives is that there's a need for us to reconnect and learn each other and really just build on our relationship as God is showing us more about ourselves as we've changed and how he's working through us. And that requires prayer. Trust me. <laughs> what you saying, husband? <laughs> <laughs> but we want to make sure that we join you in prayer and we have a prayer wall at Heartland Church slash prayer that you can put your request on and we will join with you. Absolutely. And then we want you to know that you can come on in if you are local and you're watching online. We do have seats for you. We've got some room. We would love to see you. We want to make sure that you actually have a place to make sure that you're staying connected. So like and subscribe as well on YouTube and Facebook. Now let's get ready to head into service.
He's worthy this morning. Yeah. I search the world. It couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. But then you.
Better than you. Better than you. There's nothing. Better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing's better. Nothing is better than you. One more time. Sing to the Lord. Oh, there's nothing. Oh, there's nothing. Better than you. Better than you. There's nothing. Better than you. Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Come on now, just for a minute, give him praise for what he's done in your life. He turned our tragedy to triumph. He turned our grave into a garden. He turned our mourning into dancing. I'm going to give him praise this morning. Isn't he worthy this morning? Thank you, Lord. We are so excited for this next song. It's a brand new original song. We went, yeah, we went through the 21 days of prayer, yeah. Thank you, Lord. We went through the 21 days of prayer, and our specific prayer was that God would give us songs to sing over our congregation and for our community, and this is one of those songs. Yeah, and we believe, yes, come on. And we believe that it's a simple enough song that as we sing it, that you all can sing it with us. And the, the, the message of the song is simple. It's laying aside everything that keeps us from giving God all of the glory. And how many know that each day is a fight to just lay aside every distraction and everything that keeps us from giving God the glory? So let's sing this together, amen. He's worthy. Thank you, Lord.
you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, this morning we give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. It is due to your name. There is nobody greater than you. There is no one who loves us more than you do. And we just take a few minutes this morning and honor your name. Your name is great. Your name is worthy. And we give you glory this morning. And we come asking that you would have your way in the rest of this service. We open our hearts and we hold nothing back. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Now come on, if you know that the only reason that you are here is because of the grace of God. Put your hands together this morning. While we're clapping, can we celebrate everybody who's here for the first time, as well as those who are joining us online? It's gonna be an awesome service. We're looking forward to it. Can you find a few people? Give them a high five, a fist bump, and a hug, and tell them good morning. everyone and happy Sunday. My name is Connor and I serve here on the Communications Dream Team. Whether you're here online or attending in person, we are so glad to see you. We'd love to connect with you today and we've got a card you can easily use to let us know how you're doing this week. You can find it in the seat back in front of you or by clicking connect in the top right hand corner of your screen online. We'd be honored to hear how we can be praying for you and we'll keep your information confidential. If you are new to Heartland or to following Jesus, we'd love to give you a free book called Begin, How to Know God that was written by Pastor Darren. Just bring your connection card to the info desk in the lobby or write to us at info at heartlandchurch.com to receive your free copy. Registration for our student conference, The Weekend, is still open, and we are excited to welcome our guest speaker, Pastor Mayo Sowell from Live Atlanta, to help lead some of our amazing sessions. Over this three-day experience, our students will be taught how to live out their faith in their world. With fun activities and much more, we are expectant of what God is going to do at The Weekend. For more information on how to register or serve at this event, head to heartlandchurch.com students. We can't wait to see you there. We believe God has given every one of us unique gifts and talents to fulfill the purpose He has for us. Here at Heartland, we love helping people discover their purpose, and we do this through our three-part growth track. You can take the classes in any order, and next Sunday is step one, where you'll learn more about our church and have a chance to become a member. It will take place during the 11.30 a.m. service in the chapel. I'm looking forward to all that God is going to do today, and I know that you'll enjoy today's message. I pray God's blessings over you because today is going to be a great day. Well, good morning, church. Hey, it's so great to be with you this morning. Great to see you. I told this in the last service, but I mean it more for this one. Y'all keep getting better looking every single week that we get here. So whatever you're doing, keep it up. It's good. Hey, if we've not had a chance to meet yet, my name is Nick. I'm one of our pastors here. Uh, it's such a privilege to get to worship with you guys this morning. And I want to draw your attention to a couple of things before we start. Uh, in the seat back pockets in front of you, there are connection cards. If you're watching online, we have an online connection card as well, too. And uh, that's one of the greatest ways to get connected here at Heartland, not to just sit in a seat, but become part of a family. So I'd encourage you to grab one of those today. If it's your first time, welcome. We're glad you're here. But at the bottom of that card, that's where I really want to draw your attention to. Uh, there's a perforated piece that you can pull off. It's a prayer card. Can I tell you this? A hundred percent of us need prayer for something. If you don't think you need prayer, that's what you need prayer for. So a hundred percent of us need prayer for something. Yank off that prayer card. It would be the joy of our life to pray for you this week. We got a team of all kinds of people that every week pray for hundreds and hundreds of prayer requests that come through. So fill that out. If you're watching online, we have an online prayer card as well too. Uh, would love for you to fill that out as well. Let me give you two more things. We've been doing this a little differently at the end of our services, where instead of you know getting up and running off to brunch, we're actually creating an atmosphere where we're trying to pray for people. Uh, while we're talking about prayer, the past couple weekends we've done this where at the end of the message, I've, we've asked you to, instead of just getting up and rushing out, just slow down for a second and allow space for people who desperately need prayer to come get prayer. We're going to do the same thing today, so, uh, so there's no surprises later. I just want you to know that's where we're, we're headed. Let me tell you about one other thing before we get into the offering. Uh, 
the weekend student conference. You saw that promoted a second. One person, that, and it's my wife. So thank you. Yeah, great. Y'all need to wake up. Come on, the weekend student conference is coming up. Let me tell you this. We do a lot of fun in student ministries, and it's great, and you, know, you saw all the things we do. If you are the parent of a teenager, I can't think of a more worthwhile investment for your kid's faith journey than getting away from the hustle and bustle of just the day in, day out, taking some definitive time to grow deeper in our relationship with God. I grew up going to stuff like this, and can I tell you, my spiritual walk was challenged and grown when I did that stuff. So you can still sign up, and let me just say an extra big thank you. We've had some people that they've not only said yes to serving, which is still an opportunity to do, but they've also given financially to make it possible for students to go. And we really want price to never be a barrier. So I just say thank you so much for your generosity and your kindness to get kids in the presence of Jesus. It's with that, hey, it's time for our offering. We're gonna get ready to give and give back. And while you're preparing that, all the ways to give are on our screen. But let me just tell you, I, I FaceTimed this morning with my dad. He's not here. Uh, he's actually joining us online today from India. He's over there with a team uh, of people that we've sent over there to partner with one of our partnerships called Cry of India. Uh, and when I talked to him this morning, guys, you know my dad. Uh, he was ready to charge hell with a squirt gun after what he had seen this week. Uh, it was amazing. And, and he started just telling me stories about the work that's being done over in India, how they were in one village where in this village, Every girl that's raised there is raised for one purpose, and it's exploitation. And the work that Cry of India is doing is not just getting women out of that, but the gospel is transforming the community. Ten years later, ten years we've been involved with Cry of India as a church. Ten years later, the culture has changed to now the men are raising their families and going, I don't want my daughter to go into that. I want them to be a doctor or a lawyer. The transformative power of Christ is on the move. And I just am here to say thank you. Thank you to you that, man, for being a part of that. You're not giving to a church, but you're giving through a church. And so I just say thank you for helping us go further and farther than we could ever go on our own. It's one of the greatest privileges ever. So as you get your offering ready and we get ready to give today, I want to pray for us because here's what we know to be true. God wants to speak to you today. Whether you believe that or not, he wants to speak to you. It's not a matter of if. The only if is if you're going to slow down enough to listen. And so I'm gonna invite Pastor John to come back out and come sing for us. And here's the hope is that we would rev down to maybe 50 RPMs and just be ready. The Holy Spirit speaks in a whisper. So Holy Spirit, you speak to me. I wanna hear your voice. Father God, we love you and we praise you. God, in this moment, we just thank you for your presence. God, we thank you for your goodness and that you want to speak to us. So this morning, we just simply say, speak, Lord, your servant's listening. God, come and have your way in our life. Help us to hear you like never before. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Help me welcome Pastor John. Speak to my heart, Holy Spirit. Give me the words that will bring new life. Words on the wings of the morning, the dark nights will fade away if you speak to my heart oh speak to my heart holy spirit message of love to encourage me lifting my heart from despair how you love if you speak to my heart, oh Jesus, speak to my heart. I want to hear from you, so speak to my heart. I need a word from you, Jesus. Speak to my heart for my situation. Speak to my heart. You know what? Come on, sing this part with me. Speak to my heart, Lord. Speak to my heart, Lord. Yeah. Give me your holy word. If I can hear from you, then I'll know what to do. I won't go alone. Lord, I'll never go on my own. Just let your spirit guide 
and let your word abide speak to my heart lord oh give me a holy word if i can hear from you oh lord then i'll know what to do i can't go alone i'll never go on my own just let your spirit guide and let your word abide speak to my heart Is there anything more annoying than being given advice from somebody that should never be giving you advice? Can we just be real for a minute on Sunday morning? I remember when I was 21 years old, I was a youth pastor up in Chicago. Somebody took a chance and hired me to be their youth pastor. And I remember I would talk with families and they would come in and they'd tell me about all the things that were going on with their teenagers. And I had the audacity to look at them and say, well, you know what you should be doing? You should parent them like this or to do this. Can I tell you this? Knowing about kids and raising a kid, totally different things. Amen. If you've never raised kids, don't talk to me about raising my kids. You hear me? It's one thing to know how they show up in youth group. If you've never had to break the will of a three-year-old at a dinner table, Amen. don't talk to me. Don't talk to me. I don't want to know. Your dog, not the same thing. Don't talk to me. I'll give you another one. Um, if I go to the gym, you can talk to me about macros, about HIIT workouts, about intermittent fasting, but if you're bigger than me, <laughs> is it too real for, don't talk to me, don't talk to me. Something's not lined up. I wanna be trained by Chris Hemsworth, not his flabby cousin, you see what I'm saying? Like that's. There's nothing worse than, come on, yeah, listen, you're telling me something, but something's not computing here. Like, it's not working. I, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. This is where Jesus has brought us to in chapter 7, when he's shown us the Jesus way, and he said, you want to know who's real? It's the people that don't just talk a big game, but actually have some game. Not the people that just say these things, but how does it show up in their life? You remember last week, we talked about this in Matthew 7. I'll show you again. It says this, hey, be aware. Like, be aware of false prophets who come in my name in sheep's clothing. Like, they look one way, but then they show up and you get close and you realize, that, that ain't no sheep at all. But inwardly, they're ravenous wolves. And then he gives us an indicator. Here's how you're going to know who they are. You will know them by their fruit. You will know them by their fruit. I don't know about you, last weekend was one of the most helpful messages I've heard in a long time about. Remember, how do you spot a fake Christian? How do you look for that? Uh, today, I want to push us a little bit deeper into the deep end of the pool, and I want to talk about how to not be a fake Christian. Do you feel the tension in the room when I say that, by the way? Yeah. Because here's the truth. Uh, just study the Sermon on the Mount, what we've been looking at. Very first beatitude, you remember? Blessed are those. Like, you're blessed when you recognize your need for God. When you have the humility to go, God, I need you. And I don't even know how I know that, but I need you. And God goes, yeah, you do. Climb higher. Come on, come up here with me. And as you do that, the second beatitude, blessed are those who mourn. I get close to God and I see the things that break the heart of God. And if there was ever a message that just spoke to that, it was last week. That there would be fake Christians proclaiming one thing, doing something else, right? That's why some of you have church hurt. And I hate that word. Can I just say it? It's why you have people hurt. People make up a church. God's not weird. People are weird. God's not mean. People are mean, right? You see what I'm saying? But there's a propensity within us when I see that, I go, yeah, those people are the problem. Can you believe it? Yeah, they're showing up in my small group. And the third beatitude, blessed are those who are meek. Because, come on, what does it say? It says, no, 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 something, yeah, there's some things that need to change, but what really need to change is that I need to change. There's a propensity that fake small group, or fake Christians are going to show up in my small group, that, but there's also a propensity in me that if I'm not careful, I will turn into the very thing that I'm looking for. And so today... I want to help us figure out, okay, where do we stand on this? Because Jesus continues and he says, okay, uh, the proof is going to be in the fruit. The proof is going to be in the fruit. Did you, did you catch that when we read that the first time? He says this. He continues on and he expounds upon this. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Like those two things don't go together. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. You see the two different types of fruit here? 
Just nod your head go, yeah, I see the tree. Okay, fantastic. We'll go to the next one. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. But every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, like in conclusion, by their fruits, you will know them. By your fruits, you will know them. You will know who the real ones are based on what the overflow of their life is. Like what's coming out of them. What's showing up in their life. Not just what do they say, but, but who are they? What do you see? And that's true for other people. But for us, I feel like there's a challenge in here to go, okay, the world will know us by our fruits. So the question I want you to ponder today, and really it's, it's an important question to grapple with, is this. What kind of fruit is being produced in my life? What kind of fruit? Is it good fruit? Is it bad fruit? And can I tell you, this is a question that if we don't stop and slow down, man, I think there's a world of Christians that are just settling for really subpar fruit. When in reality, God wants something bigger and greater. Here's, here's what I mean. I'm going to show you where this comes out of Scripture in a second. But when you read Scripture, you realize that there are people that are settling for some fruit. That quite honestly, the first fruit that people settle for, they settle for some fake fruit. This is an avocado, if you didn't know what an avocado is. Uh, and this avocado is perfect. Here's what I mean. Do you see the ratio of seed to meat in the avocado? You ever open an avocado and it's all seed? And you're like, who uh, hurt you? Like, what happened? Why did you turn out this way? It's perfect, right? And on the outside, it looks really good. But if I ask my friend Desiree here to just take a bite of that for me, can you do it? She says, no, why not? Because it's not real. Because it's fake. Because I ordered this on Amazon three days ago. <laughs> and it showed up overnight in my house. Because here's the deal. It looks like fruit, right? It looks like, it lo on, a, on a decorative plate somewhere, you would see this in your house and go, man, how do you keep that thing so ripe? Well, because there's nothing growing in it. It's not real. You know what this is? This is, yeah, I'm a cultural Christian. Like I grew up in Christianity. Maybe for some of you, I grew up a Catholic, and so I have the trappings of religion. Like I know all the things that I'm supposed to know, but in reality, there's zero relationship, and so it's not actually transforming anything. It's not nutritional. So I have this thing that looks like it. Like, do you go to church? Yeah, I go to church. Cool. Is it doing anything for you? No. I don't really have a real relationship at all. Can I tell you, the people that Jesus revved on the most, that got him the most revved up, it was not the sinners. Anybody that tries to tell you that, they're wrong. It's not the sinners or the tax collectors. It was the Pharisees that from the outside, look, I got this perfect fruit. But what does he say? He actually says, woe to you Pharisees. Or, or he says it this way, what sorrow awaits you teachers of the religious law and you Pharisees? You're hypocrites. Like you're saying one thing, but it's not lining up. You're giving advice, but you're not even doing what you're pe telling people to do. You're like whitewashed tombs. It's this idea of you're beautiful and ornate, but on the outside it looks good, but on the inside it's full of dead bones and all sorts of impurity. It looks this way. I got it all perfect, and it looks like, oh, man, I got it, but, but inside, come on. People get up close, and they inspect, and they go, dude, that's fake. That's not even real. Like, there's nothing to it. Outwardly, you look righteous but inwardly your hearts are filled with all hypocrisy and lawlessness. And this, can I just tell you, the danger of cultural Christianity is like I'm culturally a part of something, but I have no power that's transforming anything. Fake fruit. It's why we got to answer, what kind of fruit is being produced in my life? Because for some, it's fake. And you can see it from a mile away, and you go, dude, you're a poser, man. Like, there's no, like, that's, that's fake fruit. For others of us, though, it's not fake. It's very real. It's just unripe. So come on, you've been in a Kroger before and you pick up an avocado and you just feel it and it looks perfect and you feel it. You go, dude, that thing is like a baseball. Like I could break that TV in the back if I threw this thing with it because it's just hard. It's just not ripe. It's not mature yet. And if we don't inspect the fruit, listen, for some the fruit, it's, it's, it's real. Like it looks like this. I believe that Jesus came and he died for my sins and I better not screw up and get it wrong ever again. And I better work to earn the salvation that he came and died for me for. We've been talking about this all throughout freedom. This idea of your view of God will determine how you relate to him. And this idea to go, okay, yeah, you know what? My, my fruit is not one of love and joy and peace and patience. It's one of fear and of anxiety. And man, God is angry at me and I better get back in line and get it straight. You know what one of the telltale signs of this is? Is that I do something wrong well, I better go do 30 things to make up for the thing that I did wrong. Like it's some sort of big ledger that's kept. When actually it's an unbiblically low view of how much Jesus loves you. That he goes, hey, I took all of your sins into account so that you could be free and experience me. 
but instead you're living with some fruit. Come on, it's just not there yet. Like we can get there, it's just not there yet. It's, it's, a, it's a spirit, I love how it says in the book of Romans, it says, listen, the, the fruit, it doesn't look like how I wanted it to. It's, you didn't receive a spirit of bondage to fear, but instead you received a spirit that cries out, Abba, Father. So we can approach God's throne with confidence. Do you see that? What kind of fruit are you producing? Because I also believe this, the world is looking at the fruit that we produce. And if we have this view where we are afraid of God, watch as we put that on other people. Watch as people see us and they go, ooh, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't like that. Difference between reverent fear and fear of like, he's going to smite me. Do you see the difference between the two? So for some, I wonder if it's not fake, if it's not unripe, I think there's a third one. And the third one is that it's rotten fruit. And if the immature fruit isn't ripe, the rotten fruit has been disconnected from the vine for so long that now it's just rotten on the inside. So you remember what Jesus says? He says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me, I'll remain in you, and you will produce much fruit. Right? The problem is, is that rotten fruit is defined by pride. It's defined by this idea of look what I got and what I can do and what I'm doing to be holy when inwardly it's rotting away the very thing that Jesus is trying to do in you. So it's this knowledge-based, works-based, look at how much better I am than this other person. So on the outside, it looks like a perfect avocado, but when you open that thing up, it's just mushy and gross. You ever tried to make a guacamole with bad avocado? It ruins the whole thing. It's why some of the churches you grew up in blew up, because there were some rotten Christians. <laughs> Too real for Sunday morning. Cool. Let me show you what this looks like. Jesus talks about this in the book of Luke when he paints this picture and he shows this. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like one of those other people, like those sinners, like those robbers, the evildoers, the adulterers. I thank you that I'm, I'm not like those. I'm not like the Democrats. I'm not like the Republicans. I'm not like these fear mongers. Th see what I'm saying? Thank God I'm not like those people. And then you know the fruit because he starts giving his spiritual resume. And he goes like this. He says, I'm not like them because I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of my income, totally missing the purpose of what God's trying to produce in their life. What does he say in the Old Testament? He says, I don't desire your sacrifices. I desire mercy. So instead, you've propped yourself up by, look what I do and how good I am. In reality, he's saying, no, 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 you've missed the whole heart. In fact, he uses a counterexample, and he says, but then a tax collector who was at a distance, he wouldn't even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast it's this mercy posture position where he says, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified. You want to look at the difference of the fruit? It's one that goes, I'm an, I am a sinner in need of God's grace. God, I need him to work in me. And he continues, and he says, for those who exalt themselves, they will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. And here's the truth about the last three types of fruit we just talked about. They all stem from the same place. Some of you say, I've never read about rotten fruit or fake fruit in the Bible. Oh, yes, you have. Go read Galatians 5. Look what it says in here. It says this, but when you follow your sinful desire, your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Let me bring uh, sinful nature into the 23rd century with you. Or 20, what day is it? Into, into 2023, excuse me. <laughs> Let me bring it there. Sinful nature, what does that mean? I'm going to do me. Like, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to follow my desires. I'm in charge. I'm the boss. And this is so under the surface for some of, us, some of us. But he says, listen, when you follow that and you do that, look what happens. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery. Some of you are like, you mean like Harry Potter? What are you talking about? Sorcery? No, I'm trying to control God, the supernatural, by doing things and not doing certain things. Jealous outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension. Do you see the rotten fruit in this? You ever notice that the church really likes to talk about the first three, but we don't really talk about division or dissension or outbursts of anger, wild parties, other sins like this. And listen, here's what I'm trying to get at with this. All that, yeah, it's sin, but this gets preached sometimes as don't do those things and do good things and then God will be happy with you. So much so that in the next verse it says this. It says, let me tell you again, as I've told you before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. And some of you go, really? If I get drunk, I'm not going to inherit the kingdom of God? What have we been saying this whole series? Who you're becoming, so much more important than what you're doing. The sin is bad and it's evil. But remember, we talked about this, this idea that it's not just about not doing bad things. Yes, the sin is destructive, but underneath it is a heart that says, I'm going to do what I want to do. And what he's saying here is, yeah, those people won't inherit the kingdom of God. The people that don't look at what's being produced of them sitting in the driver's seat, 
that you will reap what you're putting in. But I want to talk about another type of fruit because the very next verse talks about real fruit. Not fake fruit, not unripe fruit, not rotten fruit, but real life-giving sustenative fruit. When he says this, he says, so that's what the sinful nature produces, but the Holy Spirit, notice who, not you, but the Holy Spirit, produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, and long-suffering. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And of these things, there is no law. When the Holy Spirit moves in and the Holy Spirit starts producing in my life, the proof is in the fruit. Who's following the Jesus way? Well, is love exuding out of their life? And let me be clear, not just love for the people that are easy to love, but love for the people that are my enemies. Come on, do I have, do I have peace that comes from understanding that I have nothing to prove to God, that he already approves of me. He approved of me before he even sent his son to die. That's why he sent his son to die, because I want you to be in relationship with me. And now I can go just be the humble, helpful servant to all. Now, come on, think about this. That kindness, goodness, faithfulness, like that's just the overflow of my life. Notice the last two, gentleness and self-control. Your life is leaving awake. People see the fruit. Can I tell you, I think in the day and age we live in today, gentleness and self-control, if that was the fruit that defined our life, I wonder what kind of impact we'd have for the kingdom of God. I wonder what would change and what would be different. And so I want to ask you again, what kind of fruit is your life producing? And I can't answer that question for you. You've got to answer that question for you. But I think God has more than what I'm even experiencing right now. And I think God wants to do something in you. Let me tell you this. What does it say? It says, this is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Here's what I get for trying to do my own thing. But when I follow the Holy Spirit, you remember we did a series last year called Good Ground, and we did it before we got to good fruit because you don't actually control the fruit growing process. You got nothing to do with it. The problem is not with the sower, it's not with the seed, the problem's with the soil. And so my responsibility, because when I read this, some of you go, okay, yeah, I know I got some bad fruit, but now what? How do I get rid of that? I saw myself all over that list that you just read. What do I do? Stop trying to just grow more love. Stop trying to produce patience. You can't do it on your own. Instead, start working on the soil. Start working on the condition and say, okay, God, you're going to grow. The Holy Spirit's growing it in me. So all I have to do is prep the ground and get it ready to receive what you're doing. And so today, I want to give you three very practical prayers and movements for how do I let the Holy Spirit grow these fruits in me? How do I get to the spot where... I can do that. And the first is this, is if I want the Holy Spirit to produce fruit in my life, I need to ask the Holy Spirit to search me, to search me. Can I tell you, this is one of the most humble prayers in all of Scripture. It comes out of 139, or Psalm 139, and it says it this way. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and see my anxious thoughts. See if there's any way offensive in me. What a humble prayer to pray. See if there's anything offensive in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Can I tell you, the people that have bad fruit, they're not praying this prayer. Because in their mind, they already know it all. And I got it. I'm aware of everything that I do and what I need to not do. No, no, no. This is a humble prayer that says, Holy Spirit, the fruit I'm even experiencing right now, you want to do more. So God, would you search me and point out any areas where the fruit might be turning? Can you point that out to me? And can I just set somebody free from something? There is this belief, I think, in Christianity that what this will look like is you're going to be sitting in your quiet time, and you're going to have your coffee, and the creamer is going to be mixed perfect, and it's going to be awesome, and you're going to be drinking it, and you're going to go, God, here are the areas that I really want to grow in and want to do. And he's going to go, you know what? I agree with you. Those are really good areas. Go have a great day. It doesn't work that way for me. You know how it's going to happen? You're going to mess up, and the bad fruit's going to show itself. And you're not even going to see it, but if you ask the Holy Spirit to convict you, watch as he shows it to you. And conviction gets a bad rap. It sounds really scary. Uh, Like, dun, dun, dun. That's not not conviction. Let Let me show you what this looks like. I'll give you a real practical example just so you don't think that we got this all figured out. Monday, I'm in my house. I'm cooking dinner for my family because I'm a good husband. Amen, somebody, to that. I was cooking dinner. And I told the boys, I said, go, I got a one-year-old and a three-year-old. I said, go in the living room, go play. And I'm cooking dinner. And as I'm cooking dinner, it gets really quiet. Listen, don't tell me how to raise my kids. But you who have kids, you know me that if it's quiet, something bad is going on. And so I walk in the living room. And when I walk in there, one of my boys has taken a blue Sharpie and has taken it to my couch and just written all over this couch. I mean, both sides of the couch, all over the place. And I walked in, 
and my response was not holy. <laughs> I walked in, and my first was like, who did this? And my three-year-old goes, it wasn't me, it wasn't me, it was Mac. And he points at Mac, and this is how I found Mac. He looks sweet. My wife posted this week. She said, free baby, comes with the Sharpie. You can pick it up. And I'll tell you, my first response when I saw this was not long-suffering or patience. My first response, I flipped out. Oh, my gosh. I wish you guys, like, thank God nobody saw this. It was, I mean, what, what? And I'm getting mad at everybody and anything. I'm mad at my wife. I'm like, why do we have Sharpies in the house? Why do, nothing in our life is permanent. Why do we have? I'm mad at the dog for breathing too hard. I'm just everything. I look at my younger, I look at my three-year-old. I'm like, why weren't you watching him? <laughs> like it's his job to do that. And can I tell you, it ruined my whole evening. I mean, absolutely ruined I went from fun dad who's making dinner to like, when are you guys going to bed? Like, how, so, how long? And you know what's crazy? I went to bed that night, and I woke up the next morning, and I'm doing my quiet time. And out of habit, because this is just a habit I've taken, I pray this prayer, God, search me. Holy Spirit, search me. And can I tell you, he didn't have to search that hard. <laughs> and he didn't speak. I didn't hear an audible voice, but you know what happened? The picture of my three-year-olds going, ah, dad, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Just the fear on his face, it got me. And I'm like, oh, hang on, wait a second, outburst of anger. Yeah, I've seen that fruit. That showed up. You know what's crazy? We're doing freedom right now, and if you've been going through freedom, you hear that the third story in the Bible is Adam and Eve sin against God. And you know what struck me this first time, or this last time we went through it? Like, nobody had to tell them to go hide. They just knew to do it. They had never sewed fig leaves together, but they sewed fig leaves. Like, nobody had to teach them how to do that. That just instinctually within them did that because they were awaiting a response from a God that's going to go, how dare you do that? When in reality, what does it say? God, as he always did, was walking, looking, saying, hey, where are you guys? Where are you at? Where you been? Come on, we do this every night we walk together. Where, where are you at? And somebody in here is going, so I can't be frustrated about the couch? No, you can be frustrated. But come on, self-control and gentleness? Can I tell you, I sat there and I had this picture to go, God, I don't think I'm treating my kid how you treat me. And so, God, I'm sorry. Thank you for pointing that out to me. And can I tell you, it didn't feel great. But I felt like God was speaking to me, and that felt better than any sort of ignorance or anything that I could be living in. And I sat there, and it was in that moment that I felt like, listen, I felt like God was speaking directly to me, going, hey, you know what? This is an area where some bad fruit showing up. And I want to help you because I want more for you than what you're currently experiencing right now. And it moved me from, because now I'm aware of it, it moved me into the next movement, which is this. I need to allow the Holy Spirit to grow my capacity. Holy Spirit, I need you to grow my capacity because here's the truth. I didn't think, man, I really should get angry here and fly off the handle and yell at my kids and yell at my wife and at the dog. I didn't think that. It just happened. Like it's an automatic behavior that just came out of me. And the realization to go, I can't just try harder. Holy Spirit, I need you. Like, I need you to help me. I need you to work in me. I need you to grow my capacity to do this. And here's why this one's such a big deal. Because a lot of times why conviction gets a bad rap is because when we get convicted, we move from dependence into despair. So it moves from, okay, God, I want to get it right to, man, I'm a failure. I can't believe how bad I messed it up. And you'll do one of two things. You'll either crucify yourself, which is dumb because Jesus already did that for you. Or two, you will just run to distraction and go, okay, well, God, that's why you have to allow him to grow my capacity. God, grow me. God, show me what to do. Grow my capacity. God, I don't even know where to start with being like you to my kids. But will you give me wisdom? Watch what it says in 1 John. I love how it says it this way. It says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. Like if we approach God, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Do you think it's God's will for you that you would produce good fruit? that you wouldn't just be the person that you've always been with the same automatic habits that come out of your first formation? Or do you think that it would be that you're being transformed and renewed by the Spirit daily? God, I'm praying that and I ask you to do that. Look, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. It's like the Father's going, oh yeah, I'll give you exactly what you're looking for. And I'll help you grow in that. You know what's amazing? When I ask him to grow my capacity, 
What's so funny about how God works is that then he's going to put me in a moment where I'm going to get to put the fruit on display and I act upon what he's telling me to do. I act upon what the spirit is prompting me to do. So I ask, I allow, and then I act upon it because I promise you this, this is not going to be as poetic as you think it is what this is going to be. I have a leadership coach that I work with, and I was lamenting to him one day saying, man, Jim, I just am losing my patience with these particular people over and over and over and over again, and I don't like that about me. Like, I need to grow in that. He said, well, good. Okay, I like that you see it. Uh, I'm going to be praying for you, and watch as God continues to bring those people into your life and give you more opportunity for you to work on your patience with them. And I looked at him, I said, you don't have a book I can read or something or something that could help me get better at this? But come on, this is how God works, right? The proof is in the fruit. Now, come on, if you would let him grow the fruit in you, if you get your heart right, get your condition right, watch as he would convict you, but then he always moves you to a place where he says, I'm going to try to do a deeper work in you. I, I, I wish that we could just grasp this idea that when he says in Scripture, my mercies are new every morning, that when I wake up, it's like the slate's been cleaned all over again. That I don't have to die on the hill of yesterday, but I get to live in the freedom of today. Okay, God, you lead me, and you guide me, and you show me, and you fill me with wisdom. And when I get it wrong, because I'm going to get it wrong, because I've been doing it this long, I didn't get into this overnight. I'm not going to get out of it overnight. When I get it wrong, may the first response in my heart to be run right back to you. And God, you speak to me again, all over again. Show me, show me, show me, show me. Because in the year in the Bible today, I couldn't think of a more perfect way to close out this message. But can I tell you, this is God's heart for you. This is my prayer for you, but this is God's prayer for you. It's this out of the book of Ephesians that I pray from his glorious and unlimited resources. Just notice those words. Like it doesn't run out. I pray that he would empower you with inner strength through his spirit. That you wouldn't just be a cultural Christian, but come on, you would be a spirit-empowered follower of the Jesus way. Then Christ, if you would do that, he will make his home in your hearts so that you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And you may have the power to be able to understand as all God's people should, come on, this is hard for you, how wide and how long and how high and how deep his love is for you. That come on, I'm inviting you into this process. Stop just focusing on growing good fruit and just get the ground right. Can I tell you this? I was working in my backyard this weekend. I didn't say this in the last service. I was working. I was re-sodding and doing some stuff. And if you're not in Indiana watching this, we've not had rain in three weeks. And the ground is so hard. Oh, my gosh. My back hurts so bad today. It's crazy. And I'm digging and I'm raking and I'm trying to get all this stuff out. And we're putting new seed down. And you know what's crazy? The ground that didn't get tilled, when the water got on top of it, it sat on top of it because it was too hard to get sucked in. But you know what's crazy? You churn that soil a little bit, and you dig down a little bit, and you make it right. That, water, that soil couldn't suck the water up fast enough. It just couldn't soak it. And I'm, I'm watching, prepping for today, going, oh, God, that's, that's what you're asking for me. That I don't ever want to get to a place where I'm dry and the ground's tough, but, God, you want to work in me. So, God, help me keep the soil so soft in my life so you can bring about the fruit that you've always meant to bring about. And I know that for somebody in here, as we read this and we look at this and the Spirit is tilling the soil of your heart right now. It was hard and it was dry, but it's like the rake got in and just worked it. And you're saying, man, my spirit's been dry for a while, but I need the Holy Spirit. If it's real, I need it. And I need Him to speak to me. I want to pray for every person in this room that feels dry today. And my prayer is that God would speak to you and He'd move in a way that maybe He's never moved in your life before. I want to invite every single one of you to stand where you're at. Because I want to pray for you and I want to ask you, don't move, don't, don't go too far. And if it's helpful for you, it's helpful for me just to open my hands as a signal of surrender to God. Come on, let's just say this prayer together. Say this with me. Say, Jesus, God, I need you. God, I need you in my life. God, I'm sorry for doing my own thing, for, sorry, for following my own sinful nature. But God, today I give you my life. Would you come and churn up the soil in me? Do a new work in my life. Thank you for dying for me. Today I ask you to come into my life. 
Come on, if you're praying this prayer all across this room, with every head bowed, every eye closed, you say, Nick, you're speaking directly to me. Just raise your hand across this room right now. Come on, yep, up in the top, all across this room. God wants to speak to you today and work in a powerful way in your life. You say, man, I'm making that decision, Nick, today. Can I tell you this right now? If that's you, and you're praying that prayer and you just raised your hand, I want to invite you right now to get up from your seat, leave from here, come to the front. I want to shake your hands. Come on, our team wants to pray for you, help you take a next step. If you're standing in a row, move out of the way, man. Let some people come up. Come down to the front right now. We want to pray, lay hands on you. Come on, as people start to begin to move, just begin to applaud and welcome people. Come on, if you say, I need a fresh work of God in my life today. I need him to do something. Come on, just keep coming. Our team is ready. We're here. We want to pray for you. That's beautiful. Proud of you. Come all the way up. Keep coming. Come on. Listen, we don't rush moments like this because God's doing something. For some of you, you say, you know what? I need God to work in me. Come on, there's something tugging on you. Say, I didn't move when he said to move at first, but I need to. And God wants to speak. You guys can come right down here. It's beautiful, guys. It's beautiful. Come right here. There's still time to do this. We're going to wrap this service up. But here's what I want to ask. If you feel convicted, start moving. Come on, God already moved towards you, and he wants to do something in you. We're going to give just a second more, because listen, I feel I, there's somebody in here that needs to move. Man, I, I thank God that time is never wasted in his presence. And there's always somebody. So let me do this. As people are coming forward. right now. Father God, we love you and we praise you. God, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. God, I thank you for new life in you. God, I thank you for the people in this room that are still coming that need prayer, God. Lord, there's no place more pertinent than church to pray. So God, I pray you do a new transformative work in their life. God, would you change people, help them to never be the same. God, move in our hearts. Speak to it, God. We love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, we're going to be here as long as we need to to pray. If you see somebody trying to make their way here, let them out. But we love you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you.